Okay, I'd like to welcome you all to the demo. Tonight's presentation will be on introductory to digital audio. Uh, this, we're going to start all the way from what is sound all the way up to how do computers manipulate sound. Probably won't get to it in this demo. Probably in the next series of demos, we'll get into things like what can you do with sound what's done to your computer? Um, you know, can, you get, can you clean up old recordings? Uh, can you um, boost a fidelity on old recordings? Can you convert mono to stereo? Can you, you know, what can I do? With, can I send to friends and email? Those kind of things. Do you like to talk to your chair? If anybody needs any chairs, we know we'll fall from 145. You don't know the kind of day I've had. You're going 90 miles in that park state coming right up. Okay. See, I didn't have enough time to do what Mike wanted me to do. Then my dad called and said, you know, Grandma died. Said, he did. And then my laptop crashed in the middle of putting together the demo. Okay? <laughs> so here I am. Okay, let's start out with what sound is. Probably everybody thinks they know what sound is when they hear it, but let's actually break it down. <clears throat> sound is just a pressure wave moving through the atmosphere. So when I drop this pencil over here in the capital part, what happens is this cable vibrates very slightly. We're talking very slightly. That makes the air around it vibrate, and you get this little wave of high pressure that lifts off the surface. Well, behind the wave of high pressure is a wave of low pressure. And that happens back and forth several thousand times per second. That wave travels through the air, hits your eardrum, hits the nerves and all the, all the organs inside your ear. Your brain turns it into sound. Your brain plays a lot of interesting tricks to turn sound into or noise into sound. We'll cover some of those tricks. There's some interesting things you can do with computer audio that can trick your brain into, into, into doing some interesting things. <clears throat> okay. Well, in the old days, we wanted to capture sound. We did it in an analog method. And basically what we did is we took a microphone. A microphone like this. And we had a speaker. And all of a microphone right there. Oh, a microphone really is. It's just a piece of plastic. Usually funnel shaped. With some wires wrapped around it. And bolted to the back here, inside this little shaft, is a magnet. As the sound wave travels through the air, this high and low pressure wave, when it hits this, mic this diaphragm, the diaphragm starts to vibrate back and forth. The magnet passes through this coil of wires, and the coil of wires produces an electrical current proportional to the sound wave. That's how a microphone works. That's how this microphone's working. It's basically how your ears work. You just don't use magnets, you use little tiny hair cells. Then we would take this, so you have an electrical current here that matches the sound wave, this pressure wave. And if I have a, a sound wave like from a flute and I graph the pressure wave over time, I'll see this nice signal that looks like this. It's a sine wave. You got it. A flute happens to make a pure sine wave. Okay. And this would be at the high pressure, the highest point of pressure, this would be the lowest point of pressure. The more times that this goes from high to low pressure in a second, the higher the pitch is. So a flute playing a high note might look like this, and maybe a piccolo would look like this, this playing an even higher note. Okay? The difference in pressure from high to low pressure is how loud the sound is. So the louder the sound, the greater this peak gets. The higher the sound, the closer the peaks get together. Well, in the old days of the analog recorders, we would take this electrical signal coming out of here, which was proportional to the acoustical wave. We'd run it through a little amplifier. And we might come over here and put this onto a recording head, another magnet. And we would pass a piece of magnetic tape across here. Everyone's seen these old magnetic tapes, right? Like this. This thing is just a big old spool of very thin film in here. We pass that film past that record head, and it would get magnetized because this electromagnet will produce a signal in proportion to the energy wave generated out of here. And we'd record in an analog manner. So you literally had a magnetized pattern on this piece of tape that looked just like the waveform that came into it. Kind of neat, very low tech. You can do that for a few bucks. Um, it's very easy to figure out, very easy to play back. Doesn't require a whole lot of expensive apparatus to do. We can take this and instead of a record head, we can make that a telephone line and put a speaker at the other end, and you can have a telephone out of that circuit. It's got a few little problems with it, though. This is called analog reproduction. And literally, the medium out here contains an exact example of this. If I do anything to distort the media out here, I get distortion in the playback. 
These tapes, these magnetized tapes have certain properties. They don't magnetize real fast, so I have to move the tape slow. The slower I move the tape, the lower the frequency that I can, the maximum frequency that I can record on here. So tapes have a frequency response curve to them, based on the speed, based on the material. Tapes, you leave them out in the sun, you know what happens if you leave a tape on your dashboard, right? It melts into the dashboard and doesn't, doesn't play anymore. Uh, you pass this by a big magnet or a big x-ray machine, it becomes demagnetized. You play this long enough, well, this thing wears against that head, the tape wears out and breaks, and usually gets all munched up inside the machine. The other disadvantage I have with this is I can't manipulate this. If I want to manipulate this data going back and forth, I have to build a bunch of analog circuits. I have to build an analog circuit that look at for each function I want to do. So if I want to boost the treble, I've got to build a filter that boosts the treble. If I want to boost the bass, I've got to build a filter that boosts the bass. <coughs> if I'm going to do all sorts of special effects and crossfades and things, I've got to build filters for each one of those. Every filter adds a little bit of noise, and you get this big board that you see in recording studios that's 20 miles wide and takes 15 people to run. So analog recording isn't a real good way to go. Several years ago, somebody came up with an interesting idea. They said, let's, let's come up with a way to let a computer manipulate this. They came up with this concept called pulse code modulation, or digitization. It's kind of an interesting idea. I'll go back to my waveform again here. And what they're going to do is they're going to come through here and they're going to say, let's take this waveform and I'm going to sample. I'm going to assign an arbitrary value to here and to here. I'm going to call this value 0, this value 255. Okay. And I'm going to come in here, I'm going to dice this waveform, I'm going to cut it <coughs> hundreds, possibly thousands of times per second. This all now. I'm going to divide it this way by individual discrete steps 254, 253, 252, 251, 250, on down the line. At each point, at each one of these time domains, each one of these samples in here, I'm going to come down and find out where the waveform touches that sample, and I'm going to record that number. We'll make, we know this number is 128, that's half of 255, 055. This one looks to be about maybe 132. So our first sample is 132. The next sample up here, roughly 200. The next sample up here, well, it's roughly about 225. It just goes on and on and on and on. And eventually come back down the same way. On the line. And I'll take all these numbers, all these data points, and I'll store them on a hard drive, or I'll store them in computer memory. And then if I want to play them back out, all I have to do is get another device that will produce a voltage proportionate to each of these numbers. And what I'll get is a waveform that looks kind of like this. Here's my first sample. Here's my second sample. My third sample. Third sample. Like that. And I'll actually, if you graph these, I actually get the same waveform back out. That's how computers store digital data. They actually, or digital audio, they actually take and cut this waveform into pieces. This is called the sampling rate. And they figure they assign that value that's present at the time to an, ar to an arbitrary number, and that number is called the data the, the bit depth. Okay. The faster you sample, the more times per second you cut it into pieces, the higher the frequency is you can reproduce. So if I cut this thing into pieces, say 1,000 times per second, so 1,000 times per second I'm going to have one of these lines. The highest frequency I can produce is 500 times per second. Anything higher than that, I don't get good data points. <coughs> sample rate. So they call it bitrate on when, you, when you're downloading mm -hmm. your That's your bitrate. Duh. Okay. Got it. Okay. What happened uh, <coughs> in, <Got it. laughs> what happens is as the frequency goes higher and my sample gets closer to my sample rate, I no longer get this nice and even waveform reproducing. I start getting something that starts to square off like that. So if I try to sample 1,000 kilohertz waveform with the 1,000 kilohertz sample, instead of getting a nice sine wave back out, I missed so many data points that I only get a data point here, a data point here, a data point here, that I wind up turning this nice sine wave into a triangle waveform. When you do this, your flute turns into a trumpet. The flute makes this waveform, a trumpet makes that waveform. That's called a lazing when you do that. This is called a lazing when you do this. 
And this is one of the deciding factors when you want to start doing audio, is you have to decide, well, what's the highest frequency I want to capture? A lot of people just go, well, set to the maximum my sound card will do. The problem with setting to the maximum your sound card will do is the higher the frequency that the capture rate is, the more data you have. So if I'm going to sample 500 times per second, I'm going to have a lot of have half as much data to sample 1,000 times per second. If you're trying to email this file to somebody, you want that number to be as small as you can to make the file as small as you can. Okay? If you're trying to get the best audio quality, you want that number to be as large as you can. Just like digital photography, same deal. Right? The, the greater the resolution, the better the picture looks, but the bigger the file gets in the long run. Same deal. Uh, you'll see some standards for these. And generally speaking, the human ear can hear roughly 20 to about 20,000 cycles per second. That's when you're born. You get older, this calls down to about 15, sometimes 10. If your guy calls down even lower. That's because a woman's voice is higher and we don't have to hear it that way. That's right. Well, actually, this is one of the strangest things that happens. Uh, if you graph out frequency-wise, the frequency chart, a man's voice is roughly right about here at about 1 kilohertz. A woman's voice is roughly here at about 2.5 kilohertz. Okay? Our hearing, as we get older, shifts down a little more. And in a lot of cases, if, you, if, you, if you're not working in the in the industry a lot, your hearing will chop off right around here someplace. That's where you hear a lot of these old couples where the wife is yelling at the husband because ne he never listens to what she says. He literally can't hear her anymore. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Good story. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been married? <laughs> I'm saving that. But actually, our hearing does shift down. So if I, want to, if I want to produce a really good recording, I want to capture stuff from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. That would give me a really true fidelity recording what's out there, what, what was present. What, what my ears were here. So if I don't really need all that extra data, all those extra bits, I could lower that sample rate down a little bit. No, no, no. I had something I could I could lower the sample rate down quite a bit. Since we know that the male voice is about 1K, and the female voice is about two, maybe two and a half K. If I just wanted to carry a conversation through, right? That's all I wanted to capture. I don't want to capture maybe cymbal crashing and flutes and piccolos and stuff playing. I just want to get voices across. I could capture from 300 to 3 kilohertz, basically an envelope about like this, and I would get human voices. Your telephone, you notice your telephone sounds really tinny. Guess what frequency band your telephone passes? 300 to 3 kilohertz. Okay. Your CD player got really good fidelity. Guess what it captures? 20 to 20,000, roughly. Your old analog tapes like this don't sound quite as good as CDs, but sound better than the telephone. That's because they send out roughly, depending on the tape, 100 up to about 15 or so, 15,000. And radio sends out roughly, um, I think it's uh, 300 to, uh, I think it's like 4K. FM, FM stereo sends out like 300 to about 19K. So you can see that the impact that that sample rate makes in the fidelity that you have. But if I'm going to capture, I will look here at 20,000, I'm going to have to do a sample rate of 40,000 to capture that. So CD quality sound is generally 40,000 samples per second. And I need to have roughly for your ears to not hear a lot of really jagged stuff in here, these big heavy steps on sample rate, I'm going to need roughly 16-bit sample. That's exactly what we get 40, exactly. But um, be careful, we don't the speeds or the sound? Well, it starts with 40, okay. and then it goes to the 16, or, or it goes higher, and then the end one is like people in a 28 or something. Like no, you're talking about the, you're talking the speed of the CD player. That would be the last one, right? Yeah, but that's not this. The first ones are not the same thing? No, that's not this. Okay. That's how fast your CD will spin that CD disc in the ground. This is how fast the CD, how much, how much data the CD has to run for audio. Yeah, they're close. <laughs> Luckily, this 10 years ago, and this is magic. You know, one of the uh, I also need to capture stereo. So, a, 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 a CD, for every second of CD audio, I have two bits, because there's 16 bits, it's two bits, or two bytes rather. And I have 40,000 bytes going past times two, because I'm doing stereo, so I have two times 40, it's 80, times another two, it's 160. So, so a CD has to be able to record to do audio 160 kilobits per second. And if you ever look when you're burning CD software, it tells you right on there what X is 116 kilobits. That's where they get that from. Okay. Uh, 
telephones. Uh, if I'm going to do telephones, well, I need to go to about 3K, and to get a good sample on 3K, I need to really go, I need to have about a 4K sample rate, roughly. Um, I'm sorry, an 8K sample rate, rather. If I have an 8K sample rate on telephone, we don't do full 16-bit, we only do 8 bits. So if I take my 8K sample rate, we're not doing stereo, it's only mono, so I take 8K, 8,000 times per second, 8 bits, I wind up with 64 kilobits per second. That's what the telephone will pass on its bandwidth back in the network where they, because your, your analog telephone at your house, when it gets to the central office, they digitize it. They digitize it to a 64 kilobit bandwidth. You ever wondered why you can't get a modem that's any greater than 56K? You ever notice that 56K modems have a little star next to them? They say it can actually go higher, but the FCC says we can't. Well, the FCC, what happens is the FCC says, that, remember that the lot of this amplitude is, the higher this bit number goes. The FCC says you can't make it as high as with the line will support because you'll, you'll, engage, you'll create crosstalk. That's where you can hear the telephone conversations. So the FCC says the modem can only put out seven bits worth of power, 8,000 times a second times seven is 56. That's why your modems can never go any faster than 56K. The underlying telephone infrastructure back there doesn't go any faster than that. Okay. Where do you get this? Where do you get the samples from? I mean, how do you? I know what you what you got, but where do you get it from? How do I know what what numbers to use? Probably. Okay. I have to know what I'm recording. If I'm recording, um, like I'm, I want to record a CD. You want to record a CD? I want to I want to take a a piece of uh, music and record it. Okay. So CD quality, you'd have to have 40 uh, 40,000 sample bits. Where do I get that? How do How do you know that? Where do I get that? How do I because I, I, I know that's what a CD's recorded at. I went to there and looked it up. It's already done for me. Yeah. Saying. Yeah, that, that's okay, fixed. I don't have to go get something. No. Now, no, no, you'll see later on, we're going to do some recordings. You'll see where we get asked for a sample rate. Okay. Right, that comes into play. I have to know kind of what I'm going after. Is everybody comfortable with the whole idea of. I'm sorry, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, when you're talking about this on telephones, on my phone, when I go to talk and I report it to the phone company, I keep getting KMOX all the time in the uh -huh. background. Uh, How can I get rid of that or what do I need to do? Cool. You got any ideas? Yep, yeah, sure do. You have a loose ground. They've been out and checked and checked and checked and can't find them. You, well, you, have, you have a loose ground or the you have an amplified telephone, the amplifier on the telephone is gone down there. No, no, there's no amplified. There's an answering machine and all kinds of stuff in yeah. there. You've, you've got a loose ground, though. Somewhere, somewhere loose ground. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of one of the weird things. Tel telephones, just in case you really cares. You have two wires and a telephone. Could that be a loose ground in the phone itself or just in the jack? Oh, it could be a loose ground like in this neighborhood out in the wire and it comes oh, to, wow. the, to the neighborhood. I mean, you, you may never find this. <laughs> the, well, the reason, I, I can just create a ground anywhere. I should be able to eliminate it then. Huh? No, because you, get, you get what's called a ground loop. Yeah. Okay. What, what happens is that your telephone coming out of central office, we have a positive 48 volts down here. This is a zero volts. And they actually, it used to be in the old time, in the old days, they literally, they literally only sent one wire out to your house. And they, they that, that back in the central office, they put a big rod down the ground, and out your house put a big rod in the ground, and they let this, the current actually go through the earth to get out to your house. The problem with this is that lightning strikes kind of cause you problems, and you get really weird things like Camel X on your phone whenever this happens because this earth, the earth out here picks up a lot of really strange noise. So the telephone company started bringing out uh, Twisted Pair. What they did with that was they originally came out and they just ran two wires to everybody's house. And these wires are twisted together so that when an RF signal goes across one, it goes across the other, and you know, the noise cancels itself out. The noise in opposite directions cancels. The problem with this, though, is you take a lightning strike back here on the eight miles of telephone wire to your house, and your telephone fries you. So some engineers said, well, we need, we need to put this ground back in here so when the lightning strike comes by, we got some place we can vent that power to. Well, the problem is if you break this ground wire up uh, in here, your phone will still work. Because you're still grounded. They're still grounded. They're grounded through all the bizarre pieces of equipment they have way back in the room that don't really have a good earth ground. And you pick up any old piece of noise through here, like Camwex, fluorescent lights, spark plugs in cars, um, Game Boy Advance's television, you hear all sorts of really weird electrical noise when you do that. I've got C wire going into my house, too, or maybe 1,500 feet of it. That's probably picking up on that C wire. Too. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is called, uh, this broken ground, when you get this, it's called a ground loop. You have multiple points of reference for ground. 
and you will play hell trying to fix that. And the top will come to the cup, they'll measure that and go, you got good DC ground and it'll look good, but it won't actually work right. Well, that's what the phone company, they come out and I says, you know, I'm well, this bother my computer. They said, well, we didn't guarantee you the computer. All we're guaranteeing you the sound. That, and you're exactly right. A computer line, a telephone line is only guaranteed to pass voice up to, up to 3K. If you hook a modem to it, the telephone company will come out. But if you have problems, say, we don't care. Can you talk on it? You say, yeah, that's all you're supposed to do with it. Yeah. It's just lucky you can put a modem on there. All right, so I've ever had a couple of the idea of digitization and how we slice the sound wave up and all that. The demo CD um, that we're selling tonight has a program, a course on here. Uh, uh, see, this uh, this whole section using cool edit right here, and we're going to cool edit quite a bit of so if it has an audio course, if you guys have more more curiosity about how digital audio works, run that audio course. You just click on it, it'll run. It'll talk you through how sound travels through the air, how your ear works, how digitization works, how slicing and dicing and all kind of fun stuff works, what sample rates you need, and, and all those kind of things. A lot more than I can do in just a few minutes here in the demo. Okay. With that said, let's, uh, let's show you some things we can do with audio. I'm going to show you one of the, the programs I like. It's called Cool Edit. And this is also on the demo seat on the uh, demo tonight. And Cool Edit's a very powerful sound editing program, sound generation program. And I'm just going to pull in a uh, waveform here. Here's an example. And all, all Cool Edit did right here is it just graphed this. This is this is all the the energy levels over time. We can actually zoom into here. This whole sample is about nine seconds long. I'm just going to keep zooming in. You can actually see when we get down here, those little dots are the little sample points we talked about. Okay. If you notice right down here, these numbers, those are the samples. Right now I'm at the, uh, uh, let's see, it looks like I'm right about 4.9 million samples into this thing. Okay. I could literally pull it and come in here and I could raise a sample up if I want to and edit, and, and edit the waveform. I just changed that waveform slightly. Now, granted, that one sample is so small you'll never, you'll never hear it. It's there. You can see that pop I just made? I just made a pop. But cool, it lets you record, record songs, edit songs, do really neat things to songs, and we'll play it. I want to hear from you real quick. You guys hear all the clicks on that? Okay. Those are all clicks. And I could literally come in here with cool edit. If you notice down here, uh, 44,100, that's your sample rate. This thing is sampled 44,100 times per second at 16 bit. It's CD quality, basically. I can come here with Cool Edit, zoom in on this little section right here. There's my click. That little tiny bit right there. I could zoom in even more. Uh -oh. That's my click. Okay. I could come in, I could highlight from here over to here, hit the delete button. And my click is now gone. I'll zoom back out so you can see where I was. That click's gone. No click. So if you have a little vinyl recording, you could record it with a program like Pull Edit and take all the clicks out of my hand like that if you wanted to. All the scratches. Every last one of them. It would take a while. Boy, it would ever take a while. You can do it. Absolutely, you can do it. Um, there's another way you can do a Pull Edit. Let me, let me close this back up. And reopen it again so that it clicks back in. Cool, it's got some pretty powerful things. Um, there's some bizarre things you can do. Now that you have a set of numbers in here, right? Computers can really do neat things with numbers. And something they can do is called a fast Fourier transform. There's this French mathematician who lived in the 1800s who was completely insane, like most French mathematicians who lived in the 1800s were. And he came up with this idea that all waveforms only consist of sine waves. So if you see something looks really complicated like this, it's actually a whole collection of sine waves. Millions and millions and millions of sine waves all added together. In fact, that triangular waveform we had up here is actually two sine waves. You plot out your...
Well, that concludes tonight's demo. Is it audio? Party, so I like your balls. Well, we'll give that a few minutes to see if it comes back alive here. Um, if it doesn't work, we'll all have to crowd around the laptop, okay? So, um, anyway, this bad petition named Foyer came up with this, this neat idea. It must be true because it works. He said, if I see a, if I see a signal that looks like this, it's actually sine waves. And if this happens at 1,000 times per second, what I have really is a sine wave here at 1K, and with this particular waveform, I'd have another sine wave here at 2K, that would be half the power of this one. And another sine wave here at 3K, that's one third the power, and one at 4K, that's one fourth the power, and on up to infinity. What this lets you do is, if you, is you can come in, you can look for all the frequencies that are present in the waveform, and you can subtract them. So by using, if I have a, some noise that's occurring, say, at 2 kilohertz, I can subtract that by using this, this concept. I can also get rid of clicks, because clicks just are very brief moments in time way up there like that. So what Foyer did, uh, can you see if they've got a monitor next door? What Foyer did is he, he applied that. That was just a point, not to leave. Okay. So, I can do a pull out then. So I'll come here to this little thing called noise reduction. Pull out's got all sorts of things to equalize and normalize and come over here. I can come into a noise reduction, click pop eliminator, and tell it kind of what do I have. Lots of hiss, a little bit of hiss, pops, clicks, kind of whatever have you. I'm tell it hiss plus lots of clicks. Tell it okay. It's going to go process here. Oh, uh, clips disappeared. You all want there? I play it again. What's that? No clicks. Yeah. Or take the videotape and demo. <laughs> so that's one of the things I can do with pull edit. If you also notice, this thing isn't quite as loud as it could be. Uh, there's still some unused area up here that I can make this a little louder. Or I could do something like maybe this area, I want to just increase this. So I'll just highlight this section, come here to transform, amplitude. I could say amplify and increase it by, say, 10 dB. And it just got louder, right? Or if I don't want to sit here and guess how loud I can make it without making it too loud, we're going to do this. I'll click normalize. What normalize does, it comes through and finds the biggest peak and then figures out how far away the biggest peak is from the biggest it could be and then multiplies everything by that amount. So when somebody does a really crappy recording on one of the things and some of it's real loud, then it's Some it's real quiet? Yeah, you got it. Now, if it's real loud, real quiet, I'd probably go through find the quiet sections and normalize them separately from the rest of the stuff, right? Because the loud stuff is already as loud as it can get. So you want to normalize the quiet stuff. And there's one pop up here in a minute. That just bumped the volume. That just bumped the volume. I'll show you something else I did with one time with Pull It. And uh, there's a tutorial I'm using Pull It on, on the CD. I work with telephone systems for a living. 
And one of the problems we have is we, we have computers that break down these, they, they do the same thing to digitize your speech like this or your input, or the sounds coming from the telephone just going to figure out what's going on. Um, how does a computer know if you call one of those little VRUs, those machines that you get that nobody really likes, you know, press one for your account number, press two? How does it know that you're no longer there, that you hung up? Okay. Well, how does a human know? You, you hear, well, how do I know if it's silent because you don't want to talk to this machine? Right? Because you don't talk to the machines, you call them, do you? Well, some people do, but you probably don't. So, I, I, well, you can hear the click, but I don't know if there's a click from another background noise or stuff like that. So one of the ways I could tell, if I leave my phone off hook too long after you hang up from me, don't I get dial tone? So I can teach a computer to recognize dial tone, I can tell when you're no longer there, right? So a lot of these VRUs do that. Whenever they, whenever they sit there, they're listening for touch tones and speech and all sorts of stuff from you, and if they ever hear dial tone, they go, oh, you've hung up, and they stop, and they, and they get ready for the next phone call. Well, dial tone is standard. There, there are two tones that make up dial tone, and they're standards, right? And, hmm? No, the, the two tones that make up dial tone. So when you look at your receiver, the thing you hear is dial tone is actually two frequencies. Yeah, they used to have multiples okay. and they changed it because you can go back and record the number from the sound. Yeah, that's, that's a little different. That's blue boxing. But, um, the problem, that, that's supposed to be standardized. So if I, if I write a, an application that does this, listen for dial tone, I can just have to tell, listen to these two frequencies. I can plug it into any telephone system in the world and it will find dial tone. There's one little exception. Rolling telephone systems, for some reason, they decided not to follow the standard. Their frequencies are off just a little bit. Um, okay, they're, they're like half, but they should be. And none of our VRUs were hanging up when you connect in the rolling telephones, and you put it happens, they take the phone off hook, you call, if you call, they take the phone off hook, they talk to you, you'd hang up, the VRU would sit there with the phone off hook going, are you there? I don't know, I'm just going to sit here with dial tone in his ear, that you and I would say that sounds like dial tone, but the VRU said, no, it's not precisely those two frequencies. Right? And it would leave the phone off hook, and the next person that called couldn't get hold of the beer because the phone's off hook. What about digital phones? Digital phones have a, an actual communication protocol they exchange between the, between the endpoint. And unfortunately, all digital telephones are proprietary. So like a Roland digital telephone is not like an AT&T digital telephone, it's not like a Nortel digital telephone. So you can't just buy telephony interface cards that will work at all. How's that number one telephone? That is a digital telephone? You'd have to have a computer on, on inside the, uh, on a car that process that digital protocol. Yeah, then it would actually say signal. Mm -hmm. I'll show you a little trick here. What is that PCM. 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 Yeah, we'll cover PCM here in a minute. Okay, so what I did is I went out to our, to a famous bar over here, St. Clair Square, and I made a recording of dial tone with my laptop. Okay, and here's the recording of dial tone on that switch. And the idea is if I can find the two frequencies that make up dial tone, I can tell the VRU what those two frequencies are, and it'll stop pissing off our customers. So here's the recording I made of dial tone. You hear all that rumbling in the background? That's because I was making this standing back in the equipment room with a big HVAC system over my head, and I couldn't get a good recording. So this is the best I could do. I said, man, this is, this is bad. I really can't do much with him. I've got to find the, the, the true frequencies. And he has this ability in here, but I'm fine. He'll actually show me the frequencies that are present. And somewhere in all that stuff, one of these little spikes, two of those spikes, are what I'm looking for, but I don't know which one it is. Okay? Well, doesn't, what I didn't really need to do is go back and get rid of the background noise. So what I did is I went through and... Uh, well, I've got my two frequencies down here. Okay. What I did was I made a recording of the background noise in the room. Okay, Just the background noise, no dial tone. I told Kula to subtract the background noise from that recording from the dial tone recording. Okay which just left me with the dial tone. That's the only thing that's different between the two recordings. And you can do that with Cool Edit. Um, let's see if I got the original background noise recording here. That's what's going to be the moment. Let's go. So I'm just going to zoom in on a section of waveform someplace. The original recording. Let me uh, try to do this here. 
Yeah, make a new recording out and we'll do this from scratch. What's that? A company called Centillion. It's free. Uh, the, the shareware version doesn't do everything, all, all the things that the pay one does. But pretty much everything. Let me do a stereo one. Okay. So I'm going to do just a recording of noise off this video projector. I'm making a recording over here, and I happen to stand real close to this noisy projector while I'm making my recording as an idiot, and I don't bother to clean the listening environment first. section of this, I'm going to say that's noise. Noise reduction. Get the profile from the selection. And right now what it does is it went out and looked at that little selection that it had there and generated a statistical model of what that noise looks like. Here's all the frequency components that are present. Okay, and you can see it subtracted all the stuff that was noise and turned it into complete silence in that one little section. Well, if the noise that I selected was consistent, let's bring that back. I can select the entire waveform. Okay. okay. Now that noise is gone from the entire waveform, even back in here where I was speaking, it's not gone. Now you got to be careful with noise reduction. If I picked a section of that that was me talking and said that was noise and told us to track that, it would subtract me talking from the entire phrase. Okay. Well, you got to be careful. Its idea of noise and your idea of noise are the same thing. We literally take out the exact frequency components that were present at that time and nothing else, which isn't exactly your voice isn't consistent throughout the entire frame. It's going to take out some of the noise. Yeah. That's one of the cool. It's kind of neat, neat little features. In here. There's a yeah. Oh, go ahead. Huh? And I want to edit those. Okay. Sure, sure will. In fact, um, part of our demo here tonight. How did you get it on the computer? Any kind of microphone? No, I'm going to do it right here. I have a cassette. I have a cassette player. All you need is your original cassette deck or. Uh, yeah, but these are LPs. Use your turntable. Use your turntable then. Whatever, whatever device on the back of your turntable will probably be some plugs that look like this. Okay? All you need to cable looks like this. This is RCA jacks. Eighth inch. Okay, you can buy this at Radio Shack for about five bucks. I picked this up at the last computer show for $1.99, so they're not incredibly expensive. 
If you have a Sony Walkman or you only have 8th inch, then you need an 8th inch to 8th inch. Make sure you get stereo. Again, Radio Shack, a couple bucks. Best Buy, probably 10 or 15 dollars. Walmart. I'm going to plug this in, in my case, to the line out jacks. White for white, red for red. Okay. I'm going to plug this in to my mic in jack on my on my sound card on my computer. This this will generally have a little picture of a microphone next to it on your computer. Not always. I'll put this in back over to tape. I'm going to come into here, I'm going to say new. Now at this point, i got to know what I'm doing, right? Is this a stereo recording? Is it a mono recording? How good of a quality recording is? Let's say it was, a, it was an old time recording only in mono. Don't bother recording in stereo, it's just going to waste your time. Right? This one happens to be stereo. I have to know the frequency. Remember we talked about the frequency range? I just wasn't telling you that because I like hearing my voice. You need to know it for here. Um, if I'm dealing with the tape, I know the tapes really can't reproduce much above about 15 kilohertz. So I would need a sample rate that's really not much more than 32, 30, 30,000 frequent cycles per second, somewhere in that range. A record player, um, some of the later stuff in the 70s, you know, probably got up around maybe 17 or so. So you might need something around 34. Okay. An old time radio like a, like a Victrola didn't get nearly that high. They got maybe about eight, so maybe 16 might work. So you, you pick the lowest number you can that gives you the still gets you in the frequency range that you need. Okay. Uh, for a resolution, generally you always want to pick 16-bit. 8-bit samples are, are really hard to work with. There's not enough material to, to really to, to, to do anything with mathematically. So since I'm dealing with the tape, I'm going to tell, let's go with um, 22. Let's do 32 for that. 16-bit. I'll tell it OK. And this is the record button down here. And as soon as I click record, everything that comes into this microphone jack, it's going to record. Okay. This guy hooked up to it, so I'm going to come over here and uh, hit the record button, hit the play button. And you see the little VU meters? Hmm. This is what happens when someone calls you up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and says, can you do a demo? So after we even take scratches out? Sure. Just saw me do that with that sound, didn't you? Yeah. I can take tip. I can take tip, uh, tape this out with that noise reduction trick. Um, I can take out uh, record pops. I can take out record scratches. Whatever, whatever you want. It. So in other words, on your on the old 78s, you can take out all the old scratches from the needles sure. and everything else would just get a pure clear recording. Now, now keep in mind, the recording's never going to be any better than the original started with. I can get rid of extra things like clicks. And some scratches, but I can't make uh, something that only had maybe 8K worth of content sound like it had 40K worth of content, right? right? Well, then does it make it skip a, a word or something? Can you do that? No, uh, it depends on the algorithm you use. Quillet's algorithm is, is really sophisticated. It comes through and it looks at, it, it identifies a click by how long it lasts and the frequency range it's in. And then what it does is it filters out every, anything above a certain frequency content and then puts in a little bit of gap in there so you won't hear it typically. There's some other tricks you can do with Quillet at home. We have this, this really strange law in the state of Texas where um, if you call someone at home and you leave a message on their answer machine, you're doing telemarketing or bill collecting, your message can't be any longer than 10 seconds. They passed the law, right? It sounds like a great law unless you're in the telemarketing or bill collecting world. The problem we have is our messages lasted like 11.5 seconds, okay? just a little too long. And we really couldn't get our professional voice that we did the messages to get to talk any faster. She just couldn't do it. Well, I'll show you a trick here in Quillet where I can, I can speed you up without making you sound like a chipmunk at the same time. Um, <laughs> we actually do that sometimes. And sometimes we had a deal where we wanted, to, we wanted her to slow down and speak numbers more distinctly, and she couldn't. So we just, we just slowed her down. All right, someone in the back can try this again. Let me do record. I hold them and dump down some no. Do you need a different tape, maybe? I have no, I think it's a tape player. I have played a tape in the seminar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have that. What about the record off the radio? Does radio work? Yeah, I can record off the radio. We'll do that. That's a tape. <laughs> <laughs> Just set it off channel. 
Okay, so that's all, this is me goofing around on all the way through, right? Get this thing ready. Oops. We'll cut that here in a minute. Um, so you really wouldn't want this as part of your recording for posterity while you're sitting there fumbling with the buttons. No problem. Right. Come here, highlight that. And it's delete key and away it goes. Now if you notice cool out there, said, hey, wait a second, you're dealing with a stereo signal, you can't just delete one side. So it, it actually added silence in there in its place, so it was editing both channels. Got rid of my, all my beginning noise. But here what I did is I overdrove this. Okay. Yeah, that's because I have too much signal coming in. You may, you may discover this. Uh, if this happens to you. The signal coming out of here is stronger than a microphone. This is a line-out signal, just two volts, two volts peak to peak. The microphone is just a few millivolts. If you don't have a, if you have a line-in jack on your sound card, use the line-in jack. If you're coming out of a line-out, use the mic jack to go to Mac. I'm coming from line-out to mic, so I'm going to come in here and uh, reduce my volume levels here a little bit. I'll just bring the mic level down. See if that makes it a little better. You see what happened? I bumped up my recording levels there. They shot way up. That, this, this sound card doesn't have a lot of sensitivity. Radio Shack makes a cable for going from line out to, to mic in. It's got a couple dropping resistors in there. You may want to look for that cable if you don't have a line in card. Now what about going from a, a record player? You know, I've got a, a record player that would hook up to a preamp and then the amps. Uh, can I hook up the record player into the computer? And yeah. Just like I'm doing here with this cable. That re record player, any, any, most pieces of audio gear, at least component audio gear, always have RCA jacks in the back, right? And just come, you can come out of the RCA jacks and the cable like I have here, it's RCA to eighth inch, and plug right in. Where I get myself in trouble is line out is much stronger than mic in, so I need a couple dropping resistors. Radio Shack has a dubbing cable that has those built right in. I don't have that with me since I wasn't planning on doing this. Yeah? So, that would be better than you. Absolutely. But now, yeah, you, you never, you always want to keep the amplifiers out of the circuit as much as possible. Every amplifier you have is just noisy. If you've got a tank with about 10 songs on it, then you're going to record it on your hard drive. Does this program, if you just let it go, you're going to end up with a sound file that contains 10 songs. You sure would. So you've got to stop this after each recording. No, not necessarily. I could come here with cool. I could come in. Let's say that each one of these is a sound. I could highlight it like that. It's very easy to see where one where one stops and one starts. You see the big difference in amplitude. So this little can, jump here. You can separate. Yeah, I come here and um, there's a spot here where I can say uh, someplace here delete. There's a spot where I can come in and delete everything but what I have selected. Someplace in here. I don't use that much. You can you can come and delete this by hand and then save out the section you got. You can do it that way. Um, cool. It also has this trim, this trim function. If you delete it, then it's gone. Well, you delete before and after. Are you taking a second sample then? No. I, okay. If you want all ten songs, do you have yeah. to do all ten independently? You would in that case, yeah. Okay. Well, no, you, you make one big recording, right? Right. You, you bring up the big recording, you delete the second to the tenth song, and you save it. You pull back up the original file. You delete the first song. You delete the third to the tenth song, and, and you save that. You save it? Yeah, each time, sure. I wouldn't. Well, when I delete something, it's usually gone. No, you're deleting off the you're not deleting off the file. You're deleting off the computer's memory. Oh. 
Excuse me. Yeah. There are recording things here yeah. that you, you, can, you can split them up. And yeah. you can put a line in here, and that's this song, and put a line in there, that's this, that song. Yeah. This CD has, um, has several programs that will do that for you. There's a couple programs on this CD that are just for recording from LPs and cassettes and things. Right. They will, will automatically cut them into songs when they, when they detect silence. There's a program we're going to cover here briefly called uh, Music Magic Jukebox, which is one of the best programs for doing recordings and managing large collections of files. And uh, it will do, it'll do the same thing. You just tell it to record from line in, you hit the play button, and, it, and whenever it detects silence of a certain length, you right. specify the length, it goes, okay, that was that song, starts the next one. Right. It's really easy way to do it. Yeah. yeah, just like on the tape. Question. Yeah. How big are these difficult files? He wants to know how big the files are, and, and well, that depends on how long the songs are and the sample rate, right? right? So if you're going to record everything at CD quality, we know that every second of CD quality is going to take a 160 kilobyte kilobit file, kilobyte file. Yeah. Yeah. So you figure uh, every let's see, 160k every uh, every 10 seconds is a meg, right? So if you have a 10 gig, if you have a one gig hard drive, thousand seconds and you're done. That's with CD quality. Okay. We're going to show you. We're going to show you something here in a few minutes. And let's get back to your PCM question. Also, if you save this to a WAV file, is it about ten times as big as an MP3? That, that's that's just we're getting into. That's a good lead-in for this. Uh, um, we're going to cool, we'll get out of cool it here in a little bit. And I'll show you some tricks. But we just talked about there that that digitization process where we actually sample it like that and record the whole number that we saw. That's called PCM, pulse code modulation. And right now, if I save this file. It wants to save as a PCM file, Windows PCM. And it's literally going to save every sample that's going to go to that file. Right? Literally, every single sample, the full value goes into that file, uh, in this case, 32,000 times per second. Right? Times two, because it's a 16 bit file, that means there's two bytes per every 16 bits. Times another two, because it's stereo, not mono. Okay? It gets pretty big. And you'll notice that uh, CoolEdit knows a lot of different types of file formats. There's also this raw PCM. Raw PCM is just like I talked about. Windows PCM is just like I talked about, but it does one more thing, and that puts what's called a riff header in front of it. And a riff header lets you save things. Um, this is a little tag about saving on audio information right here. Yeah. Someplace in here, and I never use this, so you to bear with me. There's a spot where I can tell it who the author is and things like that. Forget where it is. No, you have to take my word for it. There's a, there's a spot in code I can tell where, where to put the author name, the, the track name, the title name, the copyright holder's name, all that kind of additional stuff you like to have with the song more than just maybe the name of the track. And whenever I save this as a Windows file, Windows PCM file, it saves that header, it's called a RIP header, and then it saves all the PCM data. So even if you had no samples at all, you're still going about 200 bytes worth of that RIP header sitting there in addition to that. Okay? We have these other types that are here, uh, like a, a RM file, an SND file, an MP3 file, uh, a Vox file, all sorts of different file formats. Here's one that's kind of interesting: a, 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 slash, um, a slash MU law, ACM, and another one called Microsoft ADPCM. Okay? ADPCM stands for Adaptive Differential Pulse Code Modulation. Get the impression I read too many books when I was a kid. Okay? Adaptive, differ adaptive differential pulse code modulation is just like PCM, but it's a little smarter. Some guy said, you know, if I wrote War and Peace and sent a copy of it to you and discovered after I sent it to you that I had a mistake on page 38, I wouldn't bother sending you all 4 billion pages of War and Peace, right? Wouldn't I just send you page 38 again? I think so. Heck, wouldn't I just call you the phone and say, hey, by the way, Word 2, page 38, should be changed? Well, with PCM, aren't we sending the entire value again? In other words, the new information on this waveform here, from here to here, the, the new, at, this, at this particular sample, the information is 200. The information here was 132. Well, you already know 132. So why am I sending you the 132 inside this 200 again? And the 200 has 132 already inside of it. Right? Couldn't I just tell you 72, 78 rather? Right? That's what ADPCM does. ADPCM says instead of sending you, instead of using a full 16-bit in here to do this, I'm going to send you just the differences, 
And I know that the difference is, given your particular frank sampling rate, can't occur faster, and these steps can't be any greater than so many bits, so, such a certain size, so I can reduce the number of bits. So an ADPCM file is a lot smaller than a PCM file. Right? In fact, typically, you'll see an ADPCM file at uh, four bits per second, or four, four, bit de four bits in sample height, sounds as good as a 16-bit PCM file, not better. And to give you an idea on telephone systems, um, you know, we simply use 64 kilobit. A lot of companies use 32, no, that's, 32, that's 64 kilobit PCM. Well, you can use uh, 32 kilobit ADPCM, and the callers will never know the difference. Just cut the data have to send in half. Okay. So <clears throat> if I'm going to if I'm going to do a lot of this, I would probably use ADPCM rather than PCM. Now, cool edit and all these auditing programs, you don't have to convert that into PCM when they go to work with it, but you don't care. They do it behind the scenes. And your file is magically half the size. So what format you pick to save stuff in makes a big difference. Now, ADPCM is lossless compared to PCM. PCM is, is guaranteed it's the original uncompressed file. It's like the TIFF file of audio. Remember from video from the digital demo? JPEG versus Exactly, versus, versus JPEG. We're going to get into the JPEG of audio in a minute. So TIFF is completely uncompressed if you're dealing with video or, or pictures. PCM is completely uncompressed if you're dealing with audio. It's the original waveform and all of its bloat. ADPCM is just a little bit smarter. Well, some guys sat back a couple, couple uh, about a decade ago and said, you know, this is really neat, but I happen to know some things about the human ear. And I bet you if I, if I could be even smarter, I could reduce how much I send even more. What they said was, if I look at this overall spectrum of sound that goes on here, we talked about this going on, right? We know this triangle waveform has all these little frequency components, and if I start getting cymbals playing and drums crashing, I got stuff in here, got a trumpet going in here, maybe a piccolo going in here, your ear ain't that good. And all these frequencies may be present from all the different musical instruments that are playing at that time, but your ear can't hear all of them. And I'll give you a real good example. I'm going to put a cannon next to you, and I'm going to put a flute next to you. The flute's going to play, and I'm going to fire the cannon. Do you think you're going to hear the flute playing after the cannon's been fired? Not for a few, right, not for a little while. That's, that's what these guys sat down and figured out. So, you know, your brain just can't t t tell the difference. So, they come, so, what they did is they came up with this algorithm that comes through, does this big fancy Fourier tra fast Fourier transform to it, finds all these places where your ear just couldn't hear. So, like right here, my ear couldn't hear this because this guy is, he's so close to him, and this guy is so powerful, it swaps it out. Okay? And there's a whole bunch of other mathematical algorithms that comply with this. It's called psychoacoustics. And when you get all done with this, it means, it means I can throw away a good portion of this waveform and you won't know it, okay? In fact, I can throw away a lot of this. How much of this can I throw away? Well, as much as you'd like. Just keep in mind, the more that I throw away, the worse it sounds, okay? Remember we talked about this, this guy up here was 160, um, <clears throat> 160,000 bits per second to get CD quality with PCM? Well, what these guys figured out is that I can do this with as little as uh, here's I think the lens we got over. I can do this with as little as sixteen bits per second. Okay. Yeah, dramatic reduction. Okay. But I can't tell the difference. Your ear can't tell the difference. You got it. Now, if I get out of a big spectrograph and a, and a, and a program with cool edit, boy, I can, I can find the difference. I'll turn one of those big, big spectral spectro analysis program, and algorithms loose on, and I can see when you've done this. Okay, But your ear can't hear it. Okay, And they all got together. Uh, the reason they were doing this is they were trying to find a way to send audio over the Internet, because 160 kilobits per second, right? It's just, you've got a 56 kilobit modem at your house. You can't send that. Okay, this is, then back when the guys were doing this, you only had like 9.6 kilobits. You, know, you just didn't have the bandwidth to do audio real time over the internet. And that was their goal. So they came up with a way to do it in 16 bits and sounds pretty, you know, sound, sounded just like CD quality. If you don't want CD quality, we can reduce this even more. Okay, in fact, um, the audio, the video presentations that we do here, uh, when we encode these, I use four bit audio on mine. Okay. And because this is my voice, you don't, you don't hear the difference. Well, the guys that did this were not only working on how to send audio, they were also looking, working on how to send vid video with audio across the Internet. And they worked for a company called the Motion Pictures Equipment Group, MPEG. 
And they said, you know, we already have MPEG-1, which was video, layer, MPEG layer 1, which is video, MPEG layer 2, which was another form of video, and the audio went into the third layer of the MPEG file. So they abbreviated this motion pictures equipment group layer 3, or MPEG-3. Okay. This is how MPEG-3 works. It comes through here, you can start off with PCM, we do all these mathematical algorithms on him, and we throw away the stuff that you won't hear, and how much we throw away depends on how small you want that file to be and what your audio quality is you're looking for. Is that how they shrink commercials? That's how they what? Shrink commercials? Shrink commercials. On TV, radio. I don't say what you mean by shrinking. You know. Shorter. How they, how they chop time off? Mm -hmm. They just edit them to get the time off. I don't understand. Just break Yeah, they can just edit okay. mm -hmm. I can, I can chop these on and check the time off. All right? So, yeah, in two minutes. So a lot of guys said, you know, this, this is really neat. I mean, think, think what this does now. I mean, I went from this huge file I couldn't send to a file I could send out there. I can email this thing that's so small now. I can share with all my friends it's so small now. Right? I can store thousands of them on a hard drive that's so small now. It's so small I can put on a little tiny memory stick and put them in a, in a little solid state device and clip in my hip. I can store more songs than I, than I ever owned in my entire life in a little piece of memory that big. Portable MP3 players. Okay. I can get 12 hours of CD quality sound on a CD instead of one hour on a, on a CD quality CD. Now I pay a price for that. My computer had to be powerful enough to analyze this and do all this work. Okay. And if I want to do this in real time, encode and decode in real time, it's got to be fast enough to do that in real time. And you can't do this with, say, a Pentium 1. <clears throat> you might be able to play back in a Pentium 1, but you can't encode real time Pentium 1. But you may, not, you may not need to encode real time if you, in, uh, on your machine. You can encode in PCM, which any machine can do, and then say there's a PCM file, and then come back and tell it, okay, spend the next five minutes analyzing this one minute sound sample. I don't care. I'm going to go have a coffee break. Okay. Computers got faster, and some guys said, you know, since now, I can, since now I can encode as fast as I can get it off the CD, I can encode in real time. Well, I can pop my CDs in here now, which have the data stored PCM, and I can rip them. Run them through, which means take, basically take the PCM data off them, run them through an MP3 compressor and store them on my hard drive. Okay. In fact, the newer machines, I have a machine at home, I can rip a, a, CD, a CD on that machine in um, about 20 to 24 times its playback speed. So if it's an hour CD, I can rip it in about three minutes. And it's on my hard drive forever. I can put onto a CD and give it to my friends, which I would only do if it's legal for me to do that. <laughs> We're going to edit that part out, right? <laughs> um, you know, I, I can... But what I do with it, um, I... You were talking about demo CD, right? Yeah, demo CD. Well, you know, what I do, like, well, see, I'll give a perfect good example of that. I don't have my, MP, my CDs anymore out in my stereo. I have a computer out in my stereo. I listen to my, MP, my, my CD collection on that, stereo, on that computer there. So my CDs aren't out where they can get destroyed or cracked or bent, right? I don't sit there and go, gee, I forgot what this song is or what CD it's on, but I know it's called this. I have to thumb through 200 damn CDs. I just click on my CD managing software and it pops up and says, it's this one, okay? I got all the songs I want. I can take them to work now, right? Instead of lugging back 200 CDs back and forth to work, I lug back and forth three CDs. Yep. Has the ripper on the uh, program here? Yeah, the ripper's on the program. We're going to cover ripping here shortly. Uh, Coolette will also will let you say it was MP3. Keep in mind, though, MP3 is a lossy compression algorithm. You don't get back what you put in, right? So if you're going to edit this, and you're going to work, and you're going to do something, you're going to do noise reduction and normalization and filtering. Coolet has all sorts of filters to chop off high frequency, low frequencies. Um, you want to save this as PCM because if you save it as MP3, you go, well, I want to bring it back in and get rid of noise. Well, now you've got noise you've added by saving it as MP3 in the first place and you lost some of the original material. So it's just like when you're dealing with digital photography. You don't want to save it as JPEG if it's permanent archival material. If it's archival material, you want to save it uncompressed. If you want to share it or store you know, on something small, then you compress it. All right. I'm terrible with Like, if I want to say I, I have a song on the computer, I don't want it on my hard drive because it's going to get up space because I don't want to. Will, that, will how much, how do I know how much will fit on a disk? You have to do, well, it depends. You have to do my file size by minutes. How much does a disk hold? A disk? Yeah. 650 meg or 700 meg, depending on the size of disk you buy, on two sizes. Right, so if you have a file that's two meg in size, right, you can store 350 of them. <coughs> hmm? okay. If you have a file that's two megabytes in size, right, 
and you have a 700 meg CD, you can store 350 of those files on your CD. That's no well, no. I just said that's a file size. I don't know if it's compressed or not. If it's, if it's compressed, right, two meg would be would have more seconds in it than if it was not compressed. I'm struggling here. <laughs> we'll just ignore you. How's that? It works. Don't hold down the fire. It works. It works. Yeah, it works. Um, the, the other disadvantage by doing MP3s, though, is compatibility. If, if I'm going to, let's say that I take these MP3s I have, I can play them back on my computer, no problem. If I put them on a CD as MP3s, that's a data CD. I can't put that into my CD player and play them. Now, there are some newer CD players and some newer DVD players that will play CDs full of MP3 files. So I can do that. But the older CD players, like in your car, your portable CD players, all the CD players your friends have, you give them a CD, a, a computer CD with MP3 files on there, and go, here you go, it's... 20, it's 300 songs, they're not going to be able to play it. They'll put it in their CD player and come back and say, no disk present. It doesn't understand the format. So if that's the case, I'm going to have to reconvert that back to store to MP3. I'm going to store that, convert that back to MP, uh, to a PCM, rather, and store that on the CD. And there are programs like Music Match that will let you copy from CD to MP3 on your hard drive and then put together a playlist and tell it, send this playlist to a CD, and the first thing it asks you, do you want a music CD or a data CD? If you say music CD, you get 60 minutes. Period. Right? You say I want a data CD, you get 700 meg, whatever, whatever that happens to work out. So that won't work on a regular CD player then? Mm. MP3 won't work. No, but, but then you'll have to go to a 60 minute then. No, you, you, can use a 700, you can use a 70 minute CD on a regular CD player if you wanted to. My CD converts it automatically. Your CD converting software will convert it automatically. So when you go into a store and say you buy a CD player for your car and it says, MP3 okay. That one will play this. That one will play that, absolutely. In fact, if I were buying a new CD player for my car and, I, and I'm a computer buff, I wouldn't buy one unless it said plays MP3s. Um, you would not? No, well, I mean, because I don't keep those around my CD collection with me. I'd rather, I'd rather, especially in a car, right? I got one CD changer in the dash. You know, I don't want to sit there, I can listen to what, maybe 10 songs on a regular CD, nine of which suck, right? So I'm sitting there fumbling in traffic. While I'm talking to my cell phone, tapping my laptop, <laughs> you know, shaving. Reading a newspaper. Yeah, I'm reading a newspaper, you know, you trying to get CDs in there. Right? I'd much rather just have one CD that's, an, that's got MP3s on there, that's got got 12 hours of music on it, and since I put the music on there, it's the music I want, not the one that the band sold me, right? So I've got just the music I want on there. It's 12 hours of pure listening enjoyment that I don't even bother to take out and take the CD out. So you would win. I would. I wouldn't buy one that didn't say MP3. You heard button. Off button? No, I don't have one of those, I'm afraid. I wish I did. But you said you have a computer in your car and not even a... No, no, it is now. Oh, I have 11 computers in my house right now, but that's another story. Okay. Uh, but, your car? My car? Um, no, I don't have a computer in the car. I do have a laptop. Um, I haven't had the... I haven't had the, the time or really the, the heart to tear my new truck apart and put a laptop, you know. Now, there, there is a guy on the web um, that has, that if you go to the website and look for MP3 players and cars, you will find people who are taking old laptops, like you buy the computer show for 100 bucks, they're putting them under the seats in their car, they're getting one of those DC to DC inverters that we talked about at the last meeting, and they're running the audio jacks under the carpeting up to, their, up to the uh, CD player up there, and they have a, the program set to automatically play CD when, when they turn it on. Right? They, just, they just pop in a CD down there, it plays a CD and, you know, under the seat, and when they're done, they put a different CD in there. And be also able to play it right off the hard drive. Yeah, right, absolutely. The reason you don't play it off the hard drive is you don't have an easy way to control what's sitting under your seat. Oh. Okay. Without people really staring at you. Well, you have somebody who <laughs> you can sit alongside you. Yeah. There's also companies now that are selling these little, these little head units that uh, they plug in USB and you put them on your dash, they have a little LCD panel, a little up, up, up down bubble, and you can you can mount that right on the dashboard and do that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. That's all I have, is I have it on my hard drive, and I don't bother to have it on the yeah, that's, plastic anymore. Yeah, it's getting a lot more, lot more common. Okay, so now we told you about MP3s and stuff. Let's, uh, let, me, let me show you the difference here. I've got this waveform out here right now. That's um, roughly this is 30 seconds of, of, uh, of audio right here at 40 at 32 kilobit per second. Not quite CD sound. I'm going to save this. 
I'm going to save it as a PCM file. Default T1. Okay, I just saved it. Now I'm going to save it again as an MP3 file. And it's just warning me, hey, this method, this uh, file type you're using, you're going to lose some of the data. You may not want to do this if you really want to edit it later on. Yeah, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Trust me. Okay. And it's kind of apparent it's giving a bunch of other stuff about um, how, how well do I want this to sound and some other things. This is kind of like this, uh, MP3 doesn't have a sampling rate to it. It has a, a maximum number of bits per second you're going to send out. So 128 kilobits talking about. I'm going to go ahead and save that. I have to choose one of these. What's the internal bit rate for? I'll show you. When we get to another program, I'm going to mess with MP3. It's a little easier. Now let me come back out here. I'm going to show you the difference of those two files. Here's my MP3, here's my uh, my Windows Wave PCM file. Notice that's three megabits, 3.8 meg in size. See a 3,852,000. No, that's that's the uh, PCM. That's the wave file. See where it says wave? Okay, so that's the wave file. Here's the exact same thing with the same quality, at least to your ears anyway, the same quality, right? It's an MP3 file. Notice the difference in size. A lot smaller, okay? Now, if you have a dial-up connection to send a 4K file via email, a 4 meg file, rather, via email, it's probably going to take you the better part of 20 or 30 minutes, okay? To send a 362 kilobit file, is probably going to take you the better part of about 20 or 30 seconds. A lot better. Usable. And what I like to do to people like Bev, who has a dial-up connection, is, uh, well, you have charter. I want to start. Yeah, <laughs> My favorite trick with Bev is I would send her stuff that, see, I can send a 4, a 4 meg file in just a few <laughs> seconds on broadband. <laughs> So I would just send up all sorts of format files. Here, try this one, try this one. I'll send her a couple hundred format files in a day. So when she goes to get her email, she has to download every single one of the things. That's how you have fun with your friends with dial-up connections. They are friends and <laughs> they want to start one. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Cool, it's a really neat program for editing, for doing recording and stuff. If you've got old, old stuff you want to record and clean up, cool, it's a way where to go. I can't get into the full demo of it, but you can see it's, it's really powerful. It's got some just some amazing things you can do in here. You can generate silence and sounds, and you can put white masks in the middle of recordings. If you ever mess with recording and tape and stuff as a, you know, as a youngster, this is great stuff to mess with. Is there a way to have a video sound? Yes. Yeah, um, here's the trick, right? You're going to love this. You get a program called Virtual Dub. You go into Virtual Dub, you tell it to save the audio stream as a WAV file. So it'll strip the audio out of, the, out of there, right? Now you got a WAV file. You bring the WAV file into Cool Edit, you do whatever you want to it, but you do not delete anything. <coughs> you, can, you can clean up pops and hisses, you can filter it, you can do whatever you want, but do not delete anything out of the WAV form. Or is that where you talk that don't match? And, well, unless you want to do that on purpose, right. Okay. Oh, if you're that. making a Japanese horror movie, you can delete things <laughs> on purpose. Then you go back into Virtual Dub and you tell it to, instead of using the, the, the audio from the video file, tell it to use it from the new WAV file you just created. And now you've got your new wave, your new audio into your video. You can even do things with cool edit. Um, I, I, I won't give a demo here, but uh, yeah. If you take some music off the radio and a DJ comes in right at the end and starts mouthing over the end of the song, can you fade that out? Sure. Through editing? Cool edit has a fade out function. Um, can you do it? Well, the problem you can you can chop it, but you're but you're going to chop the music too, right? You might be able to do some stuff with some of cool out's filters. Um, I don't know if a good way to do it, but send a good audio sound on here. Let me pull this one back up. Can, could you just cancel him out? No, not, not easily. Let me show what I can do, though. If you come in and look at this on a spectral view, right, this is what the signal type is spectrum. You can see that um, this is your frequency. It's going up here. You can see this thing is, is heavily loaded down here in the, in the human hearing range. And I'll just click some pops come up here way up in the, in the tops of your hearing range, right? So I could do some stuff to this, like um, filter it. 
let's say I want to make the silent ground telephone. Notice that what it's going to do is it's going to cut everything that isn't 440 to 350. Notice it's all gone now. Now I'll play it. speech that, that plays out there. Never fails, you have five minutes of speech about a life insurance policy and you change the policy two days later. Mm -hmm. Well, I can actually go and, and edit the person's voice. Uh, if you do a recording in here, you'll, you'll see the little waveform in their voice. You can literally spot the words. There's little bumps in the waveform. You can go and cut one out, go find the word you want from someplace else they're speaking and splice it back in there. And if you're good at it, you can actually make it sound like they, that they recorded it that way. And if you do things, one of the tricks you're going to do if you're going to do stuff like that, and this is why you should never believe anything you hear ever again in your life. But I can, I can literally make people say things they didn't say. And if, you're, if you do it bad, it sounds chopped. If you do it good, you won't hear the chops. And one of the tricks is don't cut the words too short. You always want to leave gaps. And if you have an unnatural gap, you can't make the words sound right because when you say one word, you change it to based on the previous word, then go find a place where the person took a breath and put a breath in front of it. Because when the person takes a breath, in the middle of speech, your brain goes, whoop, they're going to change. Yeah, I mean, you always got to wonder, you know, because I've done, I've done stuff at work where I've, I've showed it to, to some senior executives before when they've asked for a new piece of speech, and they thought I had it re-recorded. I mean, it was a, they didn't hear the, the break at all. And it's really hard to spot. If you, if you have a, a spot where it doesn't sound smooth and the breath doesn't take it, then take some white noise and mix it in there, and they'll never hear it. <laughs> Okay, well, that's kind of cool out of a nutshell. I'm going to show you Music Matcher real quick. Music it is different. It's, no, it's different. Um, cool out is geared towards editing sound, editing and manipulating sound, uh, getting rid of noise, adding noise, cutting speech, cutting noise, and stuff like that, right? Music Match is meant for uh, managing large collections of audio files, most likely in P3s. Right? As you notice, Cool Edit was, you know, was geared to kind of work with a file at a time you know, and all that. Music Match is designed to keep thousands upon thousands of, of files on file. Music sections on file. Uh, Music Match is, is here on the CD. It's free. Um, you can get an upgrade to what's called the Plus version for $10. It's a special they're running, I think, this week. I'd recommend you pay the 10 bucks. The, the regular version does everything the plus version does, because the plus version does it all faster. Yeah. If you, I think if you spend like 20 bucks, you get lifetime upgrades. Okay. Um, 
Pull up is pretty straightforward. This this up here is the, is the normal play section. This is where you control the playing of, of your files. Over here is what's called your playlist. So as you accumulate more and more files as you play things, they come over to your playlist. So if you queue four or five songs, they're over here. Um, on the CD is a bunch of, of um, sound effect files and stuff. If you guys are into sound effects, there's thousands of sound effects. Um, well, there's bugle call things. You guys probably didn't know that the bugle calls, there are bugle calls for every different function the army performs. They still happen today. Here are all the official bugle calls and their definitions in case you're into bugle calls. You can thank my dad for that one. Um, sound America, there's a bunch of um, sound clips in here from all sorts of different shows. Yep. Forgive me, I, I literally installed Cool Edit on the drive over here, on our uh, music match on the drive over here. Yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, get out of a different one here. M music match doesn't like some sounds for some reason. Uh, see? So as I'm playing different files here, Okay, so uh, I'm going to pull this. Let me clear this back off here. I'm going to add a couple things to pull this. I'll add this one. Notice I clicked on this one, didn't start playing yet. That one hasn't started playing, or that one. It's adding it to my pull list. Uh, it wants a different uh, filter to go play. This is a Windows Media file. It's, a, it's kind of like an MP3, but it's Microsoft's version. Can you look, when I try to put a Windows Media file onto mm -hmm. um, an audio CD? Right. Yeah, here's a trick. Never use Windows Media Player for anything, ever. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things, that, okay, as you can well imagine, this MP3 technology, right? We have a lot of problems with copyrights now. Right? People are freely exchanging files because I guess they figure after spending 20 bucks for a CD with one song, most of the life they deserve to. Right? Went on to the next track. Um, so, the record companies are all concerned that people are exchanging stuff back and forth. Bob's concerned because he's choking up all his bandwidth at HTC with it and stuff. But people aren't really concerned. Um, and what Microsoft has done is they've tried to incorporate what's called digital rights management. Because Microsoft is trying to convince the recording industry to use Microsoft products to deploy all their new songs over the internet. The recording industry doesn't want to do that because people could freely swap it. So Microsoft, inside Windows Media Player, has what's called digital rights management. And they actually scramble your song whenever you record it. So it can only play back on your computer. If you want to put it onto a CD, they're going to say, uh, wait a second, I don't want you to do that, because you can give that CD to anybody. So I always avoid Microsoft Windows Media Player like the play. They do have their uh, their own file format that's similar to P3 that actually compresses more. Like a 96 kilobit per second uh, Windows Media File sounds almost as good as 120 kilobit per second uh, MP3 file, almost. What are you using? Hmm? What are you using? Um, Playing what, like Windows Media File? Yeah, I mean, just playing. Well, I usually, usually Music Match. Now you can see right here, I, what I'm doing here is I'm actually building up a playlist as I click on, on these things. What happens is an okay one. I guess to work with Windows Media File. Okay, so I've got this playlist built up right here, right? On the side. And it's just going to play those one after the other all the way down. I can load up an entire evening's playlist in here of Bugle songs if I wanted to. Okay, and I can and I can save these. I can save this playlist. Uh, in here. Yeah, right here, save. I can save that playlist, give it a name, and then I can build a different one. So I could go through my entire mu music collection and build a playlist of slow songs, build a playlist of si fast songs, play a, build a playlist of songs that I really hate, you know, and give it to somebody, right? Um, like that, and then rather have to go hunt for that again, those songs I just bring in my playlist and they're on there. I can also come here, if you notice there's a spot here called Burn, click on this Burn button, and it'll take all the files in my playlist and put them onto a CD for me. i got to pick whether it's, whether it's a data CD or a music CD. I can also, uh, there's a Send function. Yeah, send a portable device. I have a portable MP3 player. Plug in the USB port, click on Send Portable Device, and it sends that playlist down to the MP3 player. So that's kind of cool.
pull up uh, Music Matcher in a nutshell. Uh, if you want to actually add files, do things. We'll actually show you working on CD. I was thinking when you described it, I was thinking you described it more like a library. It is, and I'll show you that in just a minute. We haven't seen the library. Music Matcher has this library. You click here, called My Library. You're not going to see anything here. And right now, I don't have anything in my library. I haven't, added, I, haven't, I haven't totally gotten a search. When you first install it, you can tell it, the conference says, do you want me to search your computer for, for uh, media files? You tell it yes. It'll scan your entire hard drive, find all your files, and put them in here for you. Okay? Organized by artist, by album, by genre, whatever you want to organize them by. So then we, yeah, it'll, it'll find them on your hard drive for you, sure. Yeah. I'm going to take the CD here. It's a regular plain old CD. The pop editor will probably start to play here in a minute. There you go. Right now, this, these are all the tracks that are on that CD. Now, if I was connected to the internet, okay, it's just complete one after the other. I can skip them. Right now, it just says track one, track two, track three, because it doesn't know what the CD is. There is nothing on the CD that tells the computer what songs are on it. There's a kind of a neat place on the internet called CDDB. I think they call it changing the grace notes. If you went through and you looked at all the CDs in all the world, and you looked at the length of the songs, of all, the length of all the songs on the CD in the order they're in, you could create a fingerprint of all the CDs in the planet, right? So you can uniquely identify them. That's what CDDB is. Every time you pop a CD into here and you key in, you can manually key in the names of these songs and stuff. It'll send it to CDDB so that if somebody else that pops in the same CD a year from now. When the fingerprint matches, it'll automatically fill the data in for them. So if I was connected to the internet, rather than seeing track one, track two, track three, I would literally see the name of the track. I would see the artist name over here where it says artist. On here, I could get track information. Uh, it'll even pop up this now playing thing and show me the picture of the artist and the other work he's done. I could click on music guide. It would show me other work he's done, other films he's been in, other bands he's been in, other people that played with him in the band, the music he's played, you know, and wow. to the point where you could, yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Yeah, you got it. I'm going to, right now I'm going to click on the record button and just pop up this recorder down here. And these are my tracks, it's off the CD. And again, if I was on CD, if I was connected to the internet, these are actually the track names. I can type, I can key in the artist name right here if I want. If I don't like the one CD DB gives me, I can, I can override it. I can key in the name of the album out here if I want to. I don't have to do this if I was hooked up to the internet, but you would think a computer club could meet in a place that has an internet connection, but you would be wrong. And I could keep all the track names over here one by one, or I could, or I could change the ones that CDDB came up with, I don't care. And all i got to do is uh, click the record button. Okay, this, you're only going to get this the first time that you can do this. It just wants to go out and make sure my CD drive can do a digital recording, and it'll just take it a second. Once this gets done, and this is the only time you'll see this, it'll come back and it'll record, it'll start to do the recording process. Uh, yeah. Uh, this this program right here actually has a CD labeling program in it. Whenever you click burn, okay. if you're in the playlist, it'll it'll it, it, there's another program, another part that'll let you make a label. Uh, I don't have to literally type them. No, you don't. Also, CD, Easy CD Creator. You can take your MP3 files, bring them to Easy CD Creator, tell them to make an audio CD, and they'll prop up a jewel case creator as well. <laughs> okay, if you notice down here at the bottom right now, it's recording that first song. And right now, it's doing this at uh, about 2.9x, or it's going to do this song, this 2 minute and 29 second song. It's going to record this into an MP3 in about uh, a minute and a half. This is going very slow. Normally, I, um, this, this on my home machine, this would run closer to about 20, 24x. And it's just going to do one after the other, after the other, after the other. As it gets done, it's going to add them into the library for me. Away we go. When you stored these, uh, say, a uh, CD on the when you go back and burn it burn it to the CD substitute, um, does that program have the intuitive address and body so that it won't add gaps in Say song where uh, say one song will have uh, tracks. Sure. Um, so the, you have the little gas 
the, the answer is it depends on how you report it. Um, <coughs> you can use Nero, and Nero, uh, you can tell Nero don't put gaps, and Nero will not put the gaps. You can tell Nero to do gaps. Yeah, it's still a little pop, and this one will probably still do the same thing. It's still probably a little pop in there. A trick you can use, you can take pull edit, merge all those into one big happy file, and throw them on CD. It's simpler just to CD. Yeah. Well, again, uh, it depends on what, what, what you're trying to do with it. Uh, if, you're, if you do a CD copy, exactly. But see, if, if, if you're if you're not if you have an MP3 player you're going into, right, then it doesn't make any sense to convert these into MP3s and throw them back out. If you're going to play on a computer, after you're better off doing this. If you notice, it added this to my library automatically for me up here. So under Chris Isaac, I got track one, and I would see all my artists here. If you have thousands and thousands of MP3 files, you would see them all here. You can, yeah. Mr. Girl, may interrupt you. This might Sorry. be a kind of hard question. For those who have computers that don't have a lot of space, there is or is there such thing as an external hard drive that people have just for their music sure. files? You could. That you play pieces where all my music is. Yep. Right here. Well, I want to do music, I don't plug it in. You could. Uh, you, you have to have USB port to, to support that, but yeah, most people do. So that can be done. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah Best Buy's got them uh, a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. yeah, you pay a lot for, for a USB drive, unfortunately. You can build your own, uh, you can buy a USB drive enclosure, and you supply your own hard drive. USB drive enclosure is like $30 or $40, and you'd have to put your own hard drive in it. So if you have an old hard drive laying around, you know. Yeah, it's a great way to do it. The advantage of doing that is I can take that USB hard drive now, right, to work and plug it into my work computer, and I've got all my music files with me. There, there, there are rumors. I've heard rumors of people out there on the internet, um, different forums and things, of people that have just literally. We're not talking like megabytes. We're not even talking gigabytes. We're talking terabytes of, of audio stuff. To, to give you an idea, of, to get an idea of what we're talking about, um, a terabyte of music is enough music if you listen to it every day for the rest of your life, 24 hours a day. Your great great grandchildren would still have music to listen to. Okay. Not the same. Yeah, never hear the same song twice. You got it. Absolutely. Okay. So now these are in my in my library here. I can click on them and play them, and they're coming off the computer rather than off the CD. And okay, they don't sound quite as good as the CD, but you'll never probably notice the difference. I notice um, right now, if you notice down here, we're doing MP, we're doing digital. That's what the D stands for. 120 kilo per second. Um, that's, the, that's how many bits per second we're telling the, the MP3 compressor to save. Uh, MP3 at 128 is near CD. It's not. It's more like FM quality. On computer speakers, you won't hear the difference. On, um, <coughs> on, on rugged stereo, you'll notice the difference. On headphones, you might notice the difference. A lot of people have started recording MP3s at, at 192 now, and at 192, you won't hear the difference. Another neat little thing with Cool Edit, I'm going to tell us to go ahead and stop here. I'm sorry, with uh, Music Match. I come into Options. Oh, well, yeah, that's really one thing. I'm here in my hard drive now. I have this directory. It's called My Music. Here's Chris Isaac. That's the, full, that's the artist. That's the name of the song. Here are all the tracks. Okay. You notice he gave the name, the artist, and the dashes there. Uh, I can tell him, if I, and that's nice for keeping track of him, I can tell him up here in uh, settings real quick. <clears throat> right now, uh, in the recorder, this is where you tell them where to stick things. Um, right now, when he makes those names, he's going to... Right now, see, he's going to use the, uh, uh, an art, a to the artist in the album. The artist and the track name. You can you can add different things. Like I could do track number, and the album it came off of. So down here, the file name would be document settings. Chuck my document my music artist slash album track number dash artist dash track name dash album. So you can, that, that becomes a file name. So it's easier to keep track of. If you just have like the artist or like the CD and the, and the track number, a lot of people don't know what CD came off of. But now if you're on the internet, mm -hmm. you put that CD in, it will automatically give you your artist. 
the CD it will, but again, I, I, I can take the CD out of here, I don't need it anymore, I've got the files on the hard drive, right? So now how do I know what CD those files came off of? Well, it's by the file name, right? right. or by what's called the ID3 tag, which is inside the ID3 file, I can rip that. Now, if you get into, into a lot of, of uh, sharing MP3 files with people, you'll discover that not everybody uses the same standards for naming songs and the same artist name. If there's something inside of them, the rip header from the WAV file, well, MP3s have something like that, and they don't keep those the same, so there's programs that let you edit that. Uh, in fact, I can come in here and I can edit it. Uh, Coolout will let you do that. I'm sorry, Music Match will let you do that. And this is what's this is what's inside that header that I can't really see. And I can uh, select the artist name. Well, I can change that. So when I send this file to somebody, even if the file name gets corrupted, this stuff will still stay around. And there's all sorts of editing programs to let you straighten those out because you'll discover that somebody spells Chris Isaac the right way, somebody spells it wrong, like I just did. Uh, somebody gets the CD name slightly different than somebody else did, and you can use these these editors to straighten all that out. And there's a lot of editors on the sample editors on the CD. One other thing that I can do here, uh, getting into, these guys want to do um, line recordings and stuff. By source right here, if I set my source to mic in or line in, depending on your sound card, okay. Let's see, I can also do this. Um, if, I do, if I turn on auto song detect to active, and I, turn, I get my recording source to line in or mic in, or whatever I want. Now whenever I hit the record button here, this guy comes up. If I hit record, it's going to come from my mic in, so it's got plugged in. If that's a tape or, or an album, when those gaps come up between the songs, this guy will go, aha, that gap is longer than that time you specified in auto song detect, so it must be a new song. It will create a new file when that next song starts. So instead of sitting there recording all ten songs into one file and coming back and manually chopping them, this will do it for you when it records it. All automatically. Uh, if you're doing recordings, uh, you generally don't want to do other things on your computer because if you slow down the MP3 compressor, he's going to miss things or get little choppy bits of stuff in your sound. Also here in the recorder is, uh, this is where, you, by default, he said to do MP3 at 128 kilobit. You can also increase it, like you do a custom, and I usually set mine to like 192. I, I, I wouldn't when you could. <laughs> You guys know, saw that you just buy another computer. Yeah. And, that's <laughs> and the next thing you know, you have 11 computers in your house. <laughs> yeah, good deck of cards. Whoa, the low tech approach. All right. Hey. Okay. So you, you can adjust the quality here. As you can see, they, they claim CD quality 120 kilobit MP3, and I really think 192 is a little closer to CD quality. Most people won't notice 120 kilobit, though. It's pretty, pretty decent. Um, there's also some features in your player that there's some guides on how to use Music Match on, on the CD. It's kind of, that's up there. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, files that, that will let you manipulate your MP3s. There's one that lets you go through and put them all to the same volume level. So I get MP3s. For some reason on CDs, I've got, I've got about 400 CDs at home. I don't think there are two of them that have the same volume level on them. So you play one, you get blasted out of your chair, you play the next one, you have to, you know. Uh, when you record these MP3s, you can tell you can tell to prepare tracks for volume level. And, and it will actually, when it gets done, it will put those all at the same volume level for you. Yeah, it's a real nice feature. If you've already recorded your MP3 files, well, you're kind of out of luck. But there are programs on the disk that will let you do that. You just go and turn it loose on a directory. They'll find every file in there, and they will normalize every file for you right across the map. Yeah. There are some features, I think, that are not in the free version of this as compared to the one. Yeah. Where if it's down to ten dollars now, it's worth getting that. Uh, absolutely, and it I, I thought it was like thirty. That, that volume control, I swear, is one of it's not on the free version. It, it could be because it's one of the really demanded features, and so it might not be there. The label printing is not on the free version. Yeah, I know the uh, like the late, the free version only lets rip at one x or two x instead of the full speed and stuff. And for for ten bucks, yeah, the, the free version is on the CD. I, I would definitely I would invest the ten dollars and get it. Frankly, I would probably invest the nineteen dollars. And get the unlimited lifetime upgrades for it. And just so you always stay up to date. You know, you're only, you know, I know 20 bucks is expensive, but I look at, you know, 20 bucks is, you know, a couple beers. You know. The only thing is, though, I have the lifetime on that. Uh -huh. And every time that they send me something, they'll say, well, upgrade now or whatever, you have to upgrade. And it does, it's wanting your money again. 
I've, I've never had that. And I've got, the, I've got the lifetime as well. Did you register? Yeah. I think I'd write them a letter. If you, if you, have, if you go and do your retreat registry key on health, they'll, they'll walk you through that. They should be able to register your key and say, oh, yeah, you definitely paid for the upgrade. If they tell you you didn't pay for the unlimited upgrades, go back to, uh, you, you had to charge it. That's the only way to get it. Go back to where you charge it from, get your statement and show them, well, here's where I paid it. And if they still refuse to give you the upgrades, go back to your credit card company and say, I refuse this bill. You can refuse a bill that's two years old and they, they won't pay music match for it. And that usually gets their attention pretty quick. How long do they wait to pay the bills? Doesn't matter. They'll just take it back. They'll, they'll just take it back. I, I, they, they just won't give them the 20 bucks somebody else gave them. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, you can dispute bills that are. You know, the credit card, you know, if you go and dispute a bill that's four years old, you know, for, you know, for a tank of gas, they're going to kind of look at you a little funny, right? But, you know, if you've got something like this where you can say, look, I bought an unlimited lifetime upgrades and I, I've been charged the right amount and I've talked to them and they won't give me the unlimited lifetime upgrades, I want to, you know, they'll, they'll look at that. They'll certainly help you with that. Can you all cross the internet? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Can you burn the actual CD face onto the label from the internet? Uh, the actual design that's on that? Yeah, you can. There, there's a... <laughs> <laughs> can we get a... Let's stop the reporter for a second. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the CD label, the, the, the jacket, is also copyrighted. <laughs> so it would be illegal for you, if you didn't own the CD, to make a scan of it and give it to somebody that did. That said, there are websites out there that are dedicated to nothing but scans of the front and backs of CD covers and CD labels. And you could go there, download those files as JPEGs, uh, bring them into any of, the, any of the label creating programs, and you can actually create the label. In fact, there are some of them that will, there are some programs out there like Music Match that will burn the CD for you from MP3, download the CD covers for you, and print, and print the label out all in one step. But it's all Yeah, but keep in mind, you, only, you can only do that if you legally own the CD, right? And there's nothing that prevents you from doing that other than your conscience. Well, exactly, making backup CDs. Well, that's a perfectly valid, valid use of all this technology. <laughs> the, that's why the recording industry seems to think. <laughs> uh, God, uh, CDcovers.com is one of them. Uh, if you go to like Google and type in CD covers, you're going to find just thousands of them. I mean, there's, they're all out there. Some of these guys, even some of the really, really big record collectors, they can get into things like when they do reprints, they're slightly different. And sometimes if somebody finds like the version that shipped to Walmart looks different than that, these guys get all into this one on the back side says copyright on this side, this one says over on here, and they'll have both versions and you know it's just, it's nuts. Oh, I think I'm bad. These people obviously have no lives. <laughs> so uh, pull it, uh, sorry, music match and pull it. If you're just trying to get an MP3 files, get your your CD collection onto your hard drive, uh, get it back off onto CD, create covers and stuff. Manage a huge file. Music Match is the way to go. You know, it does all that rip. It's a one-stop shop. It's ripping the library management, the cover management, everything for you. If you want to record from from seat from a from a line in stuff, I would probably still use Music Match uh, in here rather than Cool Edit. I would set my source. I'd set my source to line in like I did on mic in, and rather than say MP3, I would tell him Wave, and he'll make Wave files for me. And then I can go take the WAV files that he made, which now are nice and chopped, because he did the auto sound detect for me, and he put the track names on and all that kind of stuff, because I keyed that all in there. I can bring that into Cool Edit, and then get rid of all the clicks and the pops and the hisses and the drags and the wilds and the flutters and stuff, and then bring it back and then save it back as, a, save it as an MP3 file from the Cool Edit and have it for forever in a music match. What's your thought on Rock Seal? We put Rock Seal on our computers, yeah, uh, I, I've, I've gotten rid of. I used to used to like Roxio until version um, uh, 5.5.2 5. 5. 5. or 5.215. Yeah, but um, I, I switched to Nero because they didn't support from the CD drives I had. I stayed with Nero ever since. Well, the four is fine, but every time yeah. I take four off. Do you have, you have XP Windows XP? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did you did you make sure you have the version five four XP? Yeah, it's still on. Yeah. 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 You gotta watch that too. Uh, this demo CD, um, like I said, there's all sorts of sound effects. There's a um, here, here are some uh, answering machine messages that you can you can get for people. Um, Thank you for calling nine one one. Our offices are closed because everyone is at the donut shop. <laughs> <laughs> Please be careful with this and do not play with mine, and things should be okay until we get back. 
hang up the phone now. Okay. So that there's some answer machine messages like that on here. Go to Google, type in, type in funny answer machine messages, and you'll find tons of MP3 files that are answer machine messages like that. Um, there, here's some more in here if you want to, want to do those. Uh, let's see. This is uh, an article I did for the newsletter a few months ago about how to stop tel uh, how to stop telemarketers. There's these tones, right? That the telephone company plays that tells the number's been disconnected. You put those on your answering machine, and the next time a telemarketer calls you, if the answering machine gets it, they hear the tone and they go, "Oh, well, that's a disconnected number, right?" Oh, cool. That saves you thirty dollars. Oh, yeah, from tells after. Unfortunately, now what the what the telemarketers are now doing, right? is they're ignoring the SIP tones and listening for the connect supervision signal, which is a network telephone network signal that gets passed. They're getting around that. So I, I, I suspect the days of this working are numbered, but what the heck, it's been for a while. And the, the, uh, the, there's a text by there that tells you how to actually do it. Uh, let's see. Here's how to do recordings from vinyl using CoolEdit, I believe. Yeah, using CoolEdit. How to clean up and all that kind of stuff. Uh, here are all sorts of sound effects. There's all the bugles we talked about. Um, here are more sound effects than you can possibly ever use in your entire life. I think there's 724 sound effects in here. Um, yeah, it's kind of whatever you, know, whatever you want. It's probably in here. Go to Google, type in free sound effects, and you'll find all sorts of them. This is just kind of downloaded earlier today. Uh, the Sound America. Um, these won't play with, with Music Match. They'll play with Club and a bunch of other programs. There's TV theme songs. There's comedy. There's goofy answer machine messages in there. There's just anything you can probably... I think there's like 384 uh, meg of sound clips in here. Um, just all sorts of stuff like that. Pretty much with. Here's a whole bunch of guides on how to use CoolEdit. Uh, this, this audio course here talks about all this digitization and sample rates and sound and all that. All these other things talk about how to use like the noise reduction, the batch processing. CoolEdit does batch processing. You can load 50 files through it and let it do something to them. How to use their studio plugins, they have a pro equalizer which does all sorts of equalizations and stuff. How to use the noise reduction, everything you want to know about it. Here's the files for it. Uh, here's another guide about how to use um, Music Match uh, and some of its more some of its more advanced features that are on here. So it's pretty much everything we talked about, a little more linear than we did it since I literally had two hours to prepare for the demo today. So, Thank you. Yeah, MIDI. Um, MIDI files are not really music files, they're, they're data files. So what MIDI says is rather than actually store the music, MIDI stores the notes. So instead of having a recording, MIDI just says, I have a bugle that plays from here to here and it stops and plays note A, plays note B on there. And it's, it's always synthesized, it's never, it's never a real song. So there, there are MIDI editors out there. Uh, one of the things with MIDI is you get a MIDI keyboard plugged into a USB port. You can bang on the keyboard and the computer records your notes. These MIDI files Sure. Yeah, uh, any, any of the sound cards will do that, especially the Creative Labs cards. Editing MIDI files, you can't use Cool Edit or Music Match because they're not sound files. They're, 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 they're instructions of what notes to play and what instrument to use to play. So you need a MIDI file editor, and I'm not aware of any. I'm getting the chops, and I think we're on a videotape here very shortly. So are there any more questions or anything? Uh, anybody got? Yeah, Dennis? Uh, you mentioned that the new media player for Windows media player will not allow you to record right. from it that it mixes the file. I just updated mine last night if I'm the one that I would have done it. But I had a program that I can't think of the name of it that would take audio files from either real player or from media player so you could burn it to a CD. Sure. You can also go to Windows Media Player and tell it to turn off digital rights management. It's just turned on by default. Oh, you can just turn it off. And you can turn it off. Can, yeah. Then you can make a CD from it. Yeah, you got to be careful. If you turn it off, if you've recorded anything using Windows Media Player, and then you turn off Digital Rights Management, everything you recorded no longer works. Okay. Forever. Forever. Right. You have to re-record it. Okay. I mean, I just installed. There's, there's somebody. There's somebody in our club with a 30 gig hard drive of their CD collection that recorded with it turned on. The computer crashed. They reloaded everything, and now it won't play. Not anymore. It, it's turned on by default. You, you don't get the well, prompts anymore. One of those questions it's asking you, it says, uh, do you want it protected by the privacy or something like that? You have to put a check mark in there. Not, not anymore. With, with the new version, if you, down, if you go to Windows Update, windowsmedia.com and download the latest version of Windows Media, the latest version, 
it comes turned on already for you. You don't get the question. So if you turn it off, then you can make a recording to a CD. Sure. Okay. Well, you, you can make a re if you turn it off when you did your original recording, then you can go back and put those files onto a CD. Okay. Yeah, my, that's one of the sneaky things Microsoft didn't let us really say. Oh, they turned it on automatically. They don't even ask it. Uh, it's about it, we're on tape. Okay. Any other questions for the audio demo? Well, with that, I guess we're done. Everybody have a good night and happy audio encoding. Anybody want to hear a news update? Uh, we bombed Iraq with a cruise missile, and it was an opportunity that said they.